Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Now, let's say something about the the World War One anniversary. It is too close for comfort. Uh, on the 28th, uh, Austria-Hungary declared war against uh, Serbia. On the 30th, uh, the Tsar signed the Russian mobilization, which began on the 31st. Yesterday, on the 31st, Jean Jaurès was assassinated. This was one of the great people of the uh, of, of this 20th uh, century. Jaurès had said uh, in his last speech in Brussels, right before the outbreak of the war, he had warned the ruling class of Europe. He said, you absolute masters should remember that the land is mined. Uh, in the mechanical drive and the thrill of the first clashes, if they manage to leave the mass, to lead the masses into war, the horrors of war will develop. Typhus will compete with the work of the shells and bullets. Death and poverty will hit the men sobered and they will switch. They will turn around and say to the leaders of Germany, France, Russia, Italy, and say, why are you giving us all these corpses? And then the revolution will tell them, uh, it will tell them to, uh, get out, you ruling classes, get out and ask pardon of God and men. And another, another one of his great quotes in that is, we don't know what secret treaties the governments have signed, including the French government. We only know one treaty, the one that binds us all to the human race. We don't know your Secret treaties. That's Jaurès, therefore assassinated. Um, August first, uh, we've got the declaration of war by Fran uh, by Germany against Russia. Germany mobilizes. France mobilizes. Uh, Italy declares neutrality. Switzerland mobilized. This is also often uh, forgotten. On the third of August, we have the m masterpiece of duplicity and perfidy by Sir Edward Grey. We've got on the same 3rd of August, the secret treaty, Germany and the Ottoman Empire, which brings us to the Middle East of today. Ottoman Empire enters the war on the side of Germany and uh, Germany declares war on France the 3rd of August. And remember, the key dates are really the mobilization dates, because under everybody's calculation, mobilization equals war. Now, um, Edward the Seventh is the architect uh, and his networks, right? People people are accustomed to say the Schlieffen plan was the dead hand of Schlieffen running the German war effort of 1914. Fine, up to a point. Similarly, Edward VII and his networks were the even more dead hand running the British policies through, through Sir Edward Grey. And it's the Kaiser himself who says, Sir Edward Grey is the keeper uh, of the flame from Edward VII. He embodies the policy of encirclement. And you can, uh, you can do a pretty good uh, textual study on these different books. If they don't mention encirclement very much, then they're likely to be stacked in favor of the British. Now, there is this problem. Why did Germany encourage Austria-Hungary against uh, Serbia. You have to remember that uh, because of the uh, ramshackle makeup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and its various nationalities, um, this empire was uh, very vulnerable to the agitation of a country like Serbia, right, with this South Slav or Pan-Slav uh, emphasis. So therefore, they, the Austrians had reason to be scared, but the Germans also felt that the Austrians were softies, right? The Viennese were... Uh, too soft, and they, of course, you had two elements there, the Hungarian as well as the Austrian, so they, they had structural weakness built in. Here's the big thing. Germany was acting on the experience of what happened after the Buchlau bargain of 1908. Buchlau bargain, remember, is Volsky, agent of Edward VII, gets together with the uh, Ehrenthal, the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, and he says, why don't you, or he actually says to them, why don't you uh, Austrians occupy and annex, annex, formally, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and we Russians will take 
uh, the Straits. And, of course, uh, Austria grabs Bosnia, but then uh, it's the British who say no on the um, – on the uh, on the straits right they don't want the russians to get control of the bosporus and the dardanelles from this crisis though the germans learned out of the turbulence after this that if germany and austria hungary put up a big bellicose facade russia would back down of course the real reason is because the british are not going to support them in the effort but uh, the germans don't see it that way they think that it's their own merit so they're basically saying let's play this one the way we played the buchlau the post buchlau turbulence germany and austria hungary with a nibelungen uh united front will uh, will make russia back down and of course the british had learned another lesson right the sir edward gray and uh, even edward the seventh had learned especially from things like the first and second moroccan crises that if it's clear that England will go to war, then Gray, uh, that Germany will back down. And this is what the, uh, the Kaiser actually uh, writes this. We have these, these documents right here. When, when the uh, German emperor, William II, Kaiser Wilhelm, as we're going to call him, uh, he realizes that the British have got him in this trap. He writes these marginal notes, and these are highly interesting. Here's one on a dispatch, London, the 29th of July, 1914. He writes in the, in the, uh, the margin, instead of all these British attempts at mediation, a serious word to St. Petersburg and Paris to the effect that England would not help them would quiet the situation at once, right? It's true. It's in the hands of the British, whether there's a world war or not. And at the uh, end of the same dispatch, he writes again, Earl Grey knows perfectly well that if he were to say one single serious, sharp and warning word at Paris and St. Petersburg and were to warn them both to remain neutral, that both would become quiet at once. But he doesn't do that. He threatens Germany. He's a common cur. England alone bears the responsibility for peace and war. Of course, the element here is if Germany had also said something like that to Austria-Hungary, saying, look, don't start a war with Russia. You'll be on your own. Uh, that would also have quieted things uh, no end. But the, the, the danger there, of course, was the Germans felt they'd be left with no allies whatsoever. Notice also the deception postures that are inherent in these dispatches, right? You cannot take these World War I documents, interesting though they are, at face value. Remember that the British made four, count them, four mediation proposals during July. Uh, and they kept going with the mediation proposals until the afternoon of July 29th. Uh, and then it was on the 30th that we have the various ultimatums, ultimata, Germany to France, stay out of this war. Germany to Russia, stop mobilizing. Germany to Belgium, let us come through. Um, and that what it reflects is that the German chancellor, it's, his name is written Bethmann, von Beethmann Holweg, von Beethmann Holweg uh, had built his policy on the idea the British are never going to come in. Look, they're only interested in mediating. Well, he fell victim to Perfide Albion, and he never learned his lesson as far as I can C. Now, um, let's look then this outburst. I think the most interesting of all these things um, on a dispatch from um, uh, from Russia, the German ambassador in St. Petersburg to the German uh, foreign office. Well, we're going to have to give you this next week, but he says uh, – the encirclement of Germany had been set in motion by Edward VII. Edward VII is stronger after his death than I who am alive. And there are people who believe that the British could be won over or pacified by this or that puny measure. That's the final awareness of the German Emperor William II when it's too late and he's writhing in the net. We'll see you next week on World Crisis Radio.